need to take a second to, to, uh, to thank the Tech for Africa team. They've just done a fantastic job, and I think this forum is super critical, and, um, and we should all just continue to encourage it. So let's talk about e-commerce in, in Nigeria. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Sim. Uh, my previous experiences span sort of Google and real networks, those old guys that did streaming media a while ago, and uh, a, brief stint, a brief stint doing investment banking here in Johannesburg, actually. Um, so it's good to be here and to be connecting to this country again. Um, I love building businesses, especially e-commerce businesses, it seems. And the first one um, that myself and my colleagues in Lagos um, sort of tried to wrap our minds and efforts around was Deal Day. It started out very much like a, a, group, a group buying site, but it's morphed pretty quickly and it's become this meld of TV shopping and flash sales and group buying, kind of like your very mark meets Groupon meets you know, everything else. Um, and, uh, and that's gone pretty well. And, um, and then about uh, six months ago, based on what we saw and the performance we saw in Deal Day, we decided to undertake an even greater challenge, um, which is Conga. Um, and this business is about four months old. Um, it was a, a bit of an emotional uh, time when we, you know, myself and my team, agreed that we're going to build this business because we realized how difficult it was, um, this thing was that we're trying to do. Um, so e-commerce works everywhere. Online retail works everywhere. You've got Kalahari here, 360 Buy in China, Uzun in Russia, Amazon in the United States. But we understood that there were some nuances about Africa that would make this particularly challenging. And I think that was what sort of led to that um, emotional day when we decided we were going to do this. Um, so Conga is doing well. Um, we sell all kinds of things. Uh, we deliver them across Lagos um, for now, and, um, and it's growing. Um, so uh, one of the things I spend um, a lot of my time thinking about is how do models that you see emerge in the West or in other parts of the world apply to Africa? And I'm, I'm a big student of history, and I want to encourage the, the young people here, the students especially, whenever you face these kind of contextual challenges, read up on what other people are doing in present time, but also go to the past. And I found um, the story of Sears. It's a brand I know, I think. How many people know Sears, Sears and Roebuck as a company? So massive um, retailer in the United States that was disrupted by Walmart, which was then in turn disrupted by Amazon. And I went back and I read the story about Sears, and it pointed to me it taught me a lot about e-commerce in Africa. So let me tell you about Sears. Um, it, started, it was started by this train station agent called Richard Sears, who um, received a consignment of gold watches that was intended for a local retailer. Um, and the local retailer refused to, to take the watches. And the reason was simple. is because the distributor of those watches, there was, this, there was a bit of a scam running in the United States at the time, where a wholesaler would ship um, a, a consignment to a, to a retailer. Um, that the retailer did not order. And when the retailer gets the, the watches, in this case, um, the, the, the wholesaler would say, why don't you just hang on to them? I've sent them to you already anyway, and I'll give you a great price. Um, but in this case, this particular retailer said, I'm not taking the watches. So Sears started to sell these watches to other train station agents. And um, he made uh, more income than his train station agent salary would have allowed him for several years. And so he promptly resigned. And then proceeded to print a catalog of watches that he would then distribute over the railway lines. And people received these catalog, this catalog of watches and, and send uh, a mail back with money and then receive their watches over the same railway lines. And this was the beginning of Sears. So what does this teach us? Is that really, if you look at Sears, and it became a brick and mortar store, ultimately, it was built on the back of catalogs. Uh, at one time, this catalog was so prolific and printed so widely in the United States that the poor rural people of America at the time um, referred to it as tissue paper because they used it for that purpose. There were just so many of them. Um, but here's the interesting thing. At the time that Sears was growing in the United States, the federal highway system was not built. The railway lines were still being built per capita income, the income the average American made was sitting at about $3,000 a year, right? Um, they were very rural. Most of America was still farming. Now, where does that sound like? It sounds a bit like Africa, doesn't it? And so there's a lot you can learn from this here. So what's changed? Let's jump ahead a little bit. 
Today, we have a new kind of catalog, right? It's a better catalog than the one Sears printed, right? Because you can change the prices on the fly. You can run promotions. Distribution costs for the catalog are pretty much free. Um, you can do all kinds of interesting and great things with the catalog. But I think that's where the similarities end for Africa. You see, Sears distributed those catalogs over the railway lines and then the goods over the same railway lines. But what does that mean for us here? You see, here's the point I want you to take away. If there's nothing else, here's one thing I want you to take away, which is that the distribution of the catalog is very different from the distribution of the merchandise. And this is something you have to wrap your minds around. You see, when Kalahari launched here, there was a somewhat functioning postal system. When Amazon launched in the United States, there was a postal system. Now, Conga is launching in Nigeria, and there is no postal system. So what does this mean? It means that the vast amounts of our energy and effort and intellect will go into building logistics systems, not just websites, not just warehouse management systems and inventory management systems, but actually systems for delivering merchandise. And that's a very different beast to tackle than an Amazon or a Kalahari or many other e-commerce companies around the world would have had to tackle. And it's a mistake I think many of us in Africa make where we equate the distribution of the catalog with the distribution of the merchandise. It's not the same thing. There is one company that I have tremendous amounts of respect for um, that I think we can learn a lot from as we build out e-commerce in Africa, and that's Uzun in Russia. Um, Uzun was started 14 years ago, maybe a little too early. It's um, consumed vast amounts of capital to build out what it's built, which is basically 2,100 pickup points. Think about this. Uzun has basically built out an, an, an alternative to the Russian postal system to be able to get merchandise out. 2,100 pickup points. And they've done this in an area the size of 17 million square kilometers. Let's put that in context. From Cape to Cairo, it's about 32 million, 34 million square kilometers, if my memory serves me right. So they've done this in a, an area that's half the size of continental Africa, which is just an amazing effort. And they've burned through a number of CEOs, which causes me particular worry. <laughs> um, so we have more to learn from Uzun than from Amazon, I suppose is the point. Now, there are several p pillars of e-commerce. I'm going to talk through these one by one and talk about what we've learned and how we're dealing with them. The biggest piece, of course, is logistics and fulfillment. Again, when Bezos built Amazon, he and his team built Amazon, they had a, prolifer they had a, a, a number of alternatives for fulfillment that they could use. In our case, what we've had to do is invest in, in bikes. Right now, which sit at about 20 motorbikes running around Lagos. And that's probably going to grow to about 80 over the next sort of six to 12 months. Um, we have to build that infrastructure out ourselves. Um, we basically have to figure out, uh, uh, incidental to this, is we have to figure out a way for people to pay. We talked a lot about trust before during the Hangout, where people don't want to use their cards online. We have to figure out the logistics of getting cash collection in. A lot of people in Nigeria want to do cash on delivery or card on delivery, where we show up, our drivers literally show up with a wireless terminal that's on the mobile network. You can swipe your card. This, these are all systems we've had to build from scratch. What's the other pillar? It's technology. In this case, we kind of have a plus. This is where Bezos and his guys really went through hell, right? I mean, all of the innovation you've seen in online retail, collaborative filtering, if people who bought this bought that, people who like this like that, buy this for your wife, she would like it, all of that stuff, they basically had to invent. So we're kind of riding a lot of that. We don't have to build a lot of that from scratch. But still, and this touches on another point I'll talk about later on, we have our challenges in Africa around technology that really are around human skill and the quality of human capital. The third pillar is supply chain. This is really painful. Uh, I'm going to try and explain this for um, my younger friends so they kind of grasp this because this is quite important. Um, in China, in the United States, you have manufacturers and distributors sitting around you when you do online retail. What that means is that what you actually have sitting in your warehouse may actually only be 5 to 10% of what you have on the website. So what you present on the catalog is actually, you know, 10 times what you actually have physically sitting in your warehouse. But what does this mean for countries like Nigeria and Congo and Kenya, 
where we've historically had challenges with manufacturing, where we import everything. This creates huge pressure on the finances of a business. It means that everything you offer in your catalog, virtually everything, has to be sitting physically in the warehouse. It means you're at greater risk of turning cash into dead inventory. The entire economics of the game changes. You have to think about it very differently. And the risk profile of the game changes. And here's the last one. And this is one of the reasons I'm particularly pleased to be here, is skilled human resources. I think this is where um, our governments here have not done us any service historically. I think today you have governments that have some sense popping up in places like Nigeria and other countries. So the quality of governance is improving. But through 50 years of not investing in education, we don't have folks who know how to code or hack. There's very few of us. Um, because our economies have suffered so much, we have no history of structured retail. We still retail in Nigeria like, you know, in some cases like you would have in Rome during Jesus' time. Um, that's where we are. So how do we find, you know, in South Africa, you have that advantage at least of pretty well-structured retail. You have 50 to 100 or even more years of structured retail. So we have to build technology skill while at the same time building retail skill. And that's really difficult. And the only way I can figure out that Conga and DLD are going to do this is if we work with people from other parts of the world. And in particular, I romanticize the notion of these businesses being built by South African talent. Um, and so just a shameless plug, we're doing amazing things. If you want to live in Nigeria, you should talk to me after this. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one big piece that's missing. OK, let me just finish up very quickly. Um, but here's another in interesting feature here. Um, Africa basically went from no phone lines. I remember at the time when I was in college in the United States, there was a statistic being thrown around that Goldman Sachs had more phone lines in its offices than all of Nigeria. And we've gone from, we've gone from that to 70 million phone lines in Nigeria in the span of a decade. Africa has gone from zero to 700 million phone lines in the span of a decade. It's amazing stuff. Um, and we've probably done that at a lower cost per phone line than, do you, than London would have had to do when they rolled out their couple lines underground uh, the city. What this means is that we actually have an opportunity here. I see those parallels in all kinds of places, in electricity, in power generation, in retail. I think we're going to actually leapfrog brick and mortar to a large degree. It doesn't mean brick and mortar is going to die, just like it doesn't mean open air markets are going to die. But we're going to leapfrog brick and mortar to a large degree into this new type of retail, this catalog-driven retail, um, with a very different kind of distribution means. ShopRite, which is a fantastic company, is doing fantastically well on Joburg Stock, Stock Exchange, has intentions to roll out um, stores in Nigeria. I don't remember exactly what their goals are right now, but they're consistently missing those goals in spite of their best efforts. And it's not because management isn't trying, but it's because there are infrastructural constraints in Nigeria. There are no malls. The, the traffic is so bad, who wants to drive four hours to go buy groceries? Um, so we actually, by, by sort of latching onto this new system, give the consumer something new, something fresh, a different way of doing things. So we actually have that opportunity here to build out this distribution system of retail for much cheaper costs, much more efficiently than the United States or the United Kingdom or most of Europe um, had to, um, could have done it. So I'm going to blow through this very quickly. So this is what we're facing today. I've mentioned a few of these. A complete absence of brick and mortar retail. A population that vir knows virtually nothing except informal retail. Anybody that's been to Lagos will tell you you can buy virtually anything in traffic um, on, on the streets, um, including Fifty Shades of Grey, I'm sure. And it's almost a purely mobile environment. This one's tricky because I, I don't think anybody's really figured that one out yet. What does mobile mean? Um, we have this social network that could mean all kinds of things for trust. And again, I'm not sure anybody's figured that out, especially the folks at Facebook. I think they need to be spending more time in Africa. And at the same time, you're seeing rising income levels and consumption, just like the United States at the end of the 19th century. Uh, sorry, the, um, yeah, the 19th century. What does tomorrow look like? I think e-commerce is going to be underestimated for years, as much as we're saying it and we're speaking it. I think the brick and mortar guys and the big box shops of South Africa and elsewhere will, will ignore it for too long. Um, I think where we're going is going to be different, not just from brick and mortar, but from e-commerce everywhere else. 
I think this is going to be a wedding, ultimately, of physical spaces and online. The physical spaces will not disappear. You still need those pickup points. You still, still need that physical distribution of merchandise. Amazon is rolling out some pretty interesting stuff called Amazon Locker. Who's familiar with Amazon Locker? Okay, you should go on YouTube and just Google Amazon Locker. It's a really fascinating sort of system for distribution of merchandise. Um, and uh, I think this is going to be sort of a tide that rises the small and informal retailers and producers of Africa for it to be meaningful. Um, I'm just, in that spirit of sort of leapfrogging, my, one of my favorite artists is Bob Dylan, and one of my favorite songs is Times Are Changing. And I think this speaks a lot to kind of the way I, I think about retail. I even think about Africa in general and the ability to just use technology and leapfrog entire sort of uh, chapters. I'm just going to read through this. The slow one now will later be fast. The first one now will later be last, for times are changing. Thank you. <laughs>